published and, and some that are not yet published and, and just to kind of um, to present the, the latest work to you. So I'm, um, I adapted the title a little bit from what I originally planned to talk about. Um, and uh, but, but that whatever I the, the original title is still kind of the, the content uh, that I had planned to talk about is still there. I, I just expanded a little bit. And so the, the topic of my talk today is the uh, is are the mechanisms and that, that determine the growth and the dispersal of Vibrio biofilms. And um, the the way that we approach these uh, these Vibrio biofilms, understanding Vibrio biofilms, is by studying model systems in the lab. And um, they reflect both the kind of the marine aspect of the Vibrio um, environmental habitats, but also the, uh, we also have some assays that, that kind of reflect the more infectious side of the Vibrio habitat. So specifically, we focus on Vibrio cholera as a model system, which lives in the ocean, but also uh, has an infection cycle. And as Marco mentioned, um, uh, I just wanted to briefly mention that, that we're moving to the Biocentrum in Basel, and uh, I'm also recruiting PhD students and postdocs um, for the new lab. Um, so uh, please spread the word. Um, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to, to uh, having a few more people with new ideas uh, join us. So biofilms uh, are highly abundant on our planet. And uh, recently, there was a uh, review by Hans Kurt Fleming and Stefan Wirtz, really great review actually, where they took a census of microbial life on Earth and uh, they found that, I mean, they basically categorized it into five habitats, um, which I thought was an interesting categorization. And um, these are the different layers of the terrestrial soil, the deep continental subsurface soil, and also the ocean, of course, and the uh, different layers of the sediments below the ocean. And if you believe these abundances that, um, that they have uh, kind of put down in numbers, the ocean is a relatively minor habitat compared to the terrestrial environment, um, but still, of course, a very important environment. And um, in all of these terrestrial environments, bacteria and, and microbes and archaea in general are primarily living associated with the surface. Um, and uh, the estimates are that most of them are actually also enclosed by a matrix, which makes them kind of satisfy the definition of a biofilm. So biofilm seems to be the most abundant form of life, at least in uh, these um, major habitats, um, with the exception of the ocean, um, perhaps, where uh, most bacteria are in planktonic form. But even in the ocean, of course, there are these um, uh, very particular matters, um, marine snow, for example, but also uh, on all the surfaces uh, of the ocean, including actually many of the um, animal surfaces, we have microbial communities um, that are closed by matrix, which make them also highly abundant in the ocean, even though they may not be dominant in the ocean. So biofilms are absolutely everywhere in the environment. Um, and uh, in addition to the environmental abundance, we are also in permanent contact with biofilms. Um, and so they can be good and bad for for humans, for example. So um, there's some things that are quite bad associated with biofilms in the human context, and those are uh, the dental plaque, which is the name given to biofilms in the dental and the oral cavity. And, uh, and we, of course, have to kind of brush our teeth every day multiple times to avoid this biofilm buildup, this plaque buildup on our teeth. And, uh, and, and so we are, we are kind of permanently in contact with them, and we you know, have to deal with this biofilm buildup every day. But there are also more serious infections that are biofilm related. Uh, here is a list of some of them. I won't go through kind of all of them here, but, but many of them associated with, with implants or prosthetics that, um, uh, that uh, let me just, uh, yeah, uh, they, they're associated with implants or prosthetics um, that, that kind of are, get introduced in our body. So, um, uh, for example, prosthetic joints often uh, have biofilm contamination issues. And whenever that happens, there's actually a really serious problem. You have to explant this. My, my wife is, is a medical doctor and she is actually a surgeon who, who has done many of these explants. Um, and this is a fairly common problem um, that, uh, that you have to explant these, these prosthetics. Now, biofilms are also good in many cases. We use them for wastewater treatment. <coughs> and here's an example uh, of this. Um, this is what's called a moving bed biofilm reactor. But actually, every uh, uh, wastewater treatment reactor is, is based on biofilms. And in this wastewater treatment reactor, you can see this process happening um, because we throw in these small plastic granules, which provide a lot of surface area for the biofilms to grow on. And they convert the dissolved organic carbon from the wastewater into macroscopic biomass here in yellow. 
and they can be filtered out from the water then relatively easily to leave behind cleaner water. But also biofilms are really important for plant development because they, uh, they form the roots of these plants. So here in red is the root of such a plant and in green is a biofilm that covers the root of this plant. And this biofilm fixes environmental nitrogen um, for, uh, for, which actually enables plant development and, and plant growth, which is very important for our crop. So, so biofilms are not just important for the environment or not just highly abundant in the environment, they're also uh, kind of important for our human uh, daily lives. Now, the, the major questions that we study um, in, in our, my lab um, associated with, with biofilms kind of fall into two categories. One are the questions associated with the formation of biofilm and uh, also with the function of these biofilms. And in my talk today, I'll primarily talk about this, this formation aspect. So which mechanisms determine biofilm development? And so the question is, how do you go from being an individual cell to being a multicellular structure with well-defined sizes and shapes and architectures and well-defined cellular differentiation patterns that are, that are really the hallmark of these biofilms. And so um, we study this in, in flow chambers, um, which are uh, uh, which kind of mimic uh, the environmental aspect of, of biofilms when they form, for example, for we use Vibrio here as, as a model system, when they form on, on, on a chitin surface, for example, or a general kind of any kind of flow system, for example, on, on marine snow. So. And the idea is to have uh, a very highly reproducible model system uh, for studying biofilm development uh, in these flows. And when we do this, uh, we, um, we uh, are able to watch biofilm development take place. And due to some kind of microscopy and image analysis techniques that we develop, we're actually able to follow biofilm development with fairly high resolution so that we can track all individual cells during biofilm growth up to around 10,000 cells or so. And we can even track cell lineages, which is shown here, or one of these lineages is shown in red, but actually we can track every cell lineage at the same time and come up with these family diagrams these lineage trees onto which we can then map single cell properties. For example, um, the location of individual cells or the uh, size and shape of individual cells or fluorescent reporters can all be mapped onto these nodes in these lineage trees. So we have a very high resolution uh, kind of trajectory of the whole biofilm that we can track. And um, when we did this uh, for thousands of biofilms, um, it's all like paralyzed in these microfluidic chambers that, that we have, these microfluidic flow chamber systems. Um, we can actually uh, get thousands of replica biofilms. And what we realized was that these three-dimensional renderings and these lineage trees may not be the most useful form of visualizing such biofilm development data. And, um, and so we realized that a much more useful way of looking at biofilm development was actually uh, to compress the dimensionality into, um, into something uh, that, that is easier to, to kind of represent statistically. So um, instead of you looking at all three spatial dimensions, as in these three-dimensional renderings here, we look at a principal component of the spatial variation. And we found that the primary principal component was essentially uh, just the distance of each cell to the center of the biofilm. So kind of the center of the biofilm projected on the base of the biofilm. And if, if we use that as a spatial axis, um, then this kind of represents all three spatial dimensions, but just the primary variation of three spatial, variation, uh, three spatial dimensions. And if instead of using real time on the x-axis, we use a principal component of time, which is the number of cells in the biofilm, then you can have these space-time heat maps here, these chymographs, on uh, which we can then um, average across different biofilm development trajectories and come up with these really statistically relevant statements about which, which things vary in a biofilm as it develops um, and, and what these kind of, what, what the yeah, variation of these uh, um, properties are with kind of statistical relevance. And so we can then show in color here different prop properties, for example, in the mimetic order, this is a kind of cell cell alignment of the cells inside a biofilm. You can see that that changes in space and time. So it's not, um, so you cannot only look at it in, in space or only in time, you need to have the space time information. We can also look at cellular growth rates, for example, or other properties of fluorescent reporters that we can look at. So, so there are many uh, different ways in which um, you can use these techniques. And ultimately, they're just a very useful way of looking at spatial temporal development of biofilms and dynamics or so responses of biofilms to various stresses and so on. So, um, so with this, uh, this, this, this tools uh, became very useful, I think, also for microbiologists because they 
um, most people who are studying biofilms, they, they wouldn't really um, know how to analyze these, these three-dimensional images. And so um, um, there was a lot of uh, requests for, for collaborations to the point where we could not really handle this anymore. And so we, we spun this, these image analysis techniques out into a tool called Biofilm Q, which uh, is really designed to, to do this three-dimensional image analysis of microbial communities. Um, both in this biofilm context that I've shown you, but also in the gut, you could use it or in any kind of other uh, environmental context. So, so you can use this to analyze, for example, these microbial communities uh, on the macro scale, these, um, uh, these colonies on agar, also these more microscopic colonies and pellicle biofilms on the kind of the little thin film of biofilm that forms on, on the air water interface, or also these biofilms um, on, in hosts. So we use this also to analyze, uh, these are cholera biofilms in yellow on these blue intestinal villi in the mouse intestine. So actually this is just a very general tool for three-dimensional image analysis designed for microbes. And the way that this works is that some, either you can have single cell uh, resolution and then it can do the single cell um, um, image analysis for you. But if you don't have the single cell resolution, then, um, for example, for these large microbial communities here, these, these colonies on agar, um, then this tool, Biofilm Q, kind of chops the biofilm up into little segments, little cubes, where, where each cube can then be treated as if it was a single cell. And, um, and then you can do cytometry on these cubes as if they were single cells. Um, and that gives you this uh, yeah, spatial temporal uh, dimension to your analysis. And so this tool kind of does a segmentation for you either into into these cubes if you don't have single cell resolution or into single cells. And uh, then it does all the analysis for you and then it does the graphs and visualization for you as well. So this is like a true like clickable a tool that's designed for people that, that, uh, that don't know how to do programming. Um, uh, but, but I think uh, even for people who know how to do programming like the guys in the, and the ladies in my lab, um, they still use this tool because this clickable interface is, is very useful. Okay, so with these tools for image analysis of biofilms, we now kind of went back to study how biofilms actually form, what the mechanisms are that determine biofilm development. And I think there are many ways of asking this question of, of what the relevant mechanisms are. But I think one key question about the mechanisms are the relevant, um, are the relevant cell cell interactions. And so uh, the kind of another way of phrasing this question is to ask which cell cell interactions actually determine the biofilm architecture. And so to study these uh, cell cell interactions or to determine what the relevant ones are, um, we teamed up with uh, my friend Jörn Dunkel at MIT. And this was a project that was led really by Raimo Hartmann, a postdoc in my lab, and uh, Rachel, a PhD student in, in Jörn's lab. And together we, we probed the ideas of what the relevant cell cell interactions are by uh, first using or developing a simulation approach um, which we validated by these thousands of replica biofilm developmental trajectories that we have at the single cell level. So we have this vast amount of single cell level data for this community development, and we use that data to constrain this simulation model. And the simulation model that we came up with is one that's really, at the heart of it is really this cell cell interaction process that we, that we um, put into that model. And that is based on an interaction potential so similar to how you would model like two electrons interacting or two planets interacting uh, for which you would write down or you could model them by writing down the interaction potential. Um, we wrote down this interaction potential for two cells interacting in, in such a community. And um, as is the case for these interaction potentials, you could write down any interaction that, that you like. And so we just put down some generic terms for repulsion between these two cells. So um, we just thought that there's probably like a kind of a strong repulsion that it strongly increases when the cells get very close together um, because we can't have overlapping cells. And we thought that there must be an interact, like an attractive interaction between the cells. Um, and so we, we put in this attractive uh, term to the potential. Uh, the exact terms here, we could, we could probably have used other terms as well. We just chose these terms because these kind of uh, formulations come with very precisely tunable parameters for the, for the kind of attractive potential well, for example, here. Now, we could have also put in other cell-cell interactions, but what we realized very quickly was that we do not need to actually account for other cell-cell interaction potentials. So you could have also put in a chemotactic interaction potential or cross-feeding interactions or toxin-mediated interactions, but actually none of these were actually required for accounting for this, this vast amount of single cell-level data that we have available. 
And so um, what's even more is that for, for Vibrio cholera, our model system here, uh, we could even kind of identify what the mechanistic, the molecular cause of repulsion was, and that is a steric repulsion because of collisions between the cells and an osmotic interaction, or osmotic repulsion due to a particular matrix polysaccharide that they uh, produce. And that polysaccharide then draws water from the environment and that leads to an average repulsion. And the attraction is mediated by one particular protein called RBMA that, that, will, that will feature a bit more uh, in the next uh, few slides of the talk as well. So, so with this model that we have um, for the interaction potential, we can now um, um, kind of obtain or fit the parameters of this model, the four parameters of the model to the data. And, um, and what we, when we do that um, for biofilm development up to 300 cells, we found that we get a pretty good agreement between the simulation and the experiments and these uh, particle-based simulations and the experiment. And I want to emphasize here is that, that each of these time, each of the time, each time you run this experiment and you run the simulation, they're, they're a little bit different. So there's a kind of statistical variation here, but on average, they look something uh, like this. And one thing that stood out from this, when we looked at this, was that uh, there are some emergent properties that actually the simulations already capture from the experiments that, that we did not put into the parameter fit. And those are um, color coded here in red. So in color, I've coded the local alignment of the cells. And um, what you can see here is that there are regions of highly aligned cells uh, for the experiment uh, here and here, and also for the simulation. So this is something that is an emergent property that the simulation already captures, which we thought was quite encouraging. Uh, that speaks maybe towards uh, that this model holds some element of the truth of, of, of uh, the realistic phenomenon, namely that seemingly mechanical interactions seem to dominate the biofilm development. Now to really a real test of a model like this is of course always when you probe this model by, by uh, applying perturbations to the experimental system. And so we applied various perturbations to the system to test this model. So one perturbation is that we can genetically tune the cell-cell interaction by deleting the attraction-mediating protein called RBMA, and then we bring it back in under an uh, inducible promoter, in this case, an arabinose-inducible promoter. So when we increase the arabinose concentration under which we grow these biofilms, then we would expect that the cell-cell attraction increases. And so when we do this, uh, we see that the cell-cell distance actually does decrease, so the cells become closer, packed together when we increase the arabinose concentration, which does make sense in the, in the, in the, with the idea that this RBMA protein is actually an attraction mediating protein. So the more of that protein you have, the tighter the cells are packed together. Okay, but what does our model tell us for these, these different uh, cases? Now, in the case where there's no cell cell attraction mediating protein, these biofilms are actually very unstable. And when you just perturb them a little bit, they, they, they flow apart. And this is something that actually also the model um, gives us. So in the case, if we apply our model to this case, we find that these, in these force maps here, the, uh, the interaction is primarily repulsive. And uh, I've indicated here the average cell-cell distance by this dashed line here. So the cells are just like in this metastable state where they all repel each other essentially in the model. And in the model, any perturbation would, uh, would uh, disassemble the biofilm. In the experiment, you need like a little bit of a flow perturbation because there's some residual uh, um, attraction probably due to other matrix components. Now, in the, um, in the case where we have some attraction-mediating protein, um, this RBMA, um, we actually find that there is a strong attractive well uh, in this potential here. And in fact, the average cell-cell distance sits exactly where the well would sit. So this is, I think, uh, speaks quite well in, uh, towards the, the applicability of this model, um, that the model does hold true under this perturbation of manipulating the cell-cell attraction genetically. Now, another perturbation that we can do is uh, motivated by, um, by, by changing the environmental conditions. So by applying an external field, in our case, probably the most relevant external field is the shear environment under which we grow these biofilms. So we grow these biofilms always in the presence of flow, as I mentioned. Usually we grow them in the presence of very low shear flow, which results in biofilms that look almost hemispherical. So this is the outcome here. Um, and, and I'm showing these biofilms here for the endpoint of biofilms, uh, at least the endpoint of what I mean here by endpoint is that I'm showing biofilms of different cell numbers. Those are the ones where we should compare the biofilms, uh, the biofilm morphology. And when you look at uh, the endpoint of, uh, of biofilms grown at low shear, they are these hemispherical uh, structures, whereas when you grow them at high shear, they have formed these droplet-like structures. 
And we were initially thinking that potentially the biofilms are just deformed into these droplet-like structures, but actually what I'm gonna show you is that, that that is not the case. There's a different mechanism at play here that also results in these droplet-like structures. So when we apply this perturbation of a strong external shear, uh, we see a number of modifications to the biofilm. And those are the, the internal cell-cell spacing changes, the internal cell orientation changes, and the outside morphology of the biofilm changes. And the outside morphology is quite obvious here uh, because they develop into this droplet-like structure when you grow them in the presence of high shear. But let me go through each, each of these uh, modifications and see whether our simple mechanical model, this model which is based on only the mechanical cell-cell interactions, uh, is able to, to just uh, to, to explain these, uh, these, perturbations, these observed experimental changes. So let me start with the internal cell-cell spacing. So what we observe is that the cell-cell distance in the biofilm decreases when we grow them in the presence of high flow. And what this tells us in our model is in our model, we would therefore predict that the attraction between the cells should increase, indicated by this kind of rising arrow here. So we would expect that we have a higher amount of RBMA present. Now, we can, we can test this experimentally, this prediction, by measuring the uh, amount of RBMA using an immunofluorescence, so an antibody against RBMA. And when we do this, we find that indeed there is a higher amount of RBMA in the presence of high flow. So this uh, kind of observation kind of led to this experimental, uh, this theoretical prediction, which is actually verified experimentally as well. So this, I think, makes sense in the context of this model. What about the internal cell orientation change that we see when we grow them in the presence of high shear? Well, uh, experimentally, what we see is that uh, the cells actually, are in this presence of this high flow, they reorient around this mother-daughter cell connection here. There seems to be some residual cell connection, like a hinge, hinge mechanism type thing. And, um, and that occurs yeah, at very few cells, but also for, for uh, larger structures or a few cells here, you see that the cells uh, hinge around some kind of um, mother-daughter cell connection. And, and this was something that we did not have in our model, and therefore our model could not predict these, these shapes. And, and, and the internal uh, cell orientation in the presence of high flow. So we needed to modify our model. And um, what we realized was that was, was necessary was the including in the model these mother-daughter cell connections, these little these hinge points here. And if we do include such a structure, we implemented this by a simple spring that remained for, for like a one cell division duration. And um, that's some, something what we see experimentally basically is that just for some time they're still connected to each other um, and not like there's no cytoplasmic connection but but they seem to still kind of hinge around this point and if we include this effect then we can get a good agreement between the simulations um, and the experiments for the internal cell orientations in the presence of high flow so in this case um, we can explain the internal cell orientation also with this mechanical model but we just needed to add this additional component and so uh, we can then based on this effect also explain actually the outer morphology now of the biofilm um, because of the following effect. So the mother and daughter cells remain attached, they hinge around this point. So there is some kind of, um, the cells are pointing, they're, they're standing up and they're, they're being reoriented at the top, or at least in the regions that are experiencing the shear to be uh, horizontally aligned. And that is also what we see in, in our simulations. And that is actually what then drives the formation of this droplet shape. So it's not that the biofilms are being are growing into a hemisphere and are then being deformed into a droplet like droplet shaped structure. Their, their internal orientation is what causes them to grow into the droplet uh, shaped structure. Okay, so so we can exp so our model kind of seems to make sense also in the case of this uh, um, into this case of this this external shear perturbation. And so we wondered whether we can make further perturbations to even to to even better understand. Um, whether our model applies in, in all situations to biofilm development. And the key of the model, again, is always this, the idea that biofilm development is really primarily based on mechanical cell-cell interactions. And to further study this, we, we wondered whether um, uh, if we perturb the growth uh, of the cells, um, whether that causes any changes that we can also explain with our model. And, the best way, of course, to perturb uh, cells uh, is by applying various antibiotics. Um, and so we applied antibiotics of every class of action that, that, that are available to uh, Vibrio cholera biofilms. 
and we uh, looked at the response of these biogons to uh, yeah, modifications in growth, and we saw really striking changes of the biogons. And um, the most interesting changes I thought were, were displayed by translational inhibitors. And I'm showing you one example here for tetracycline. And, uh, and you can see that in this movie here, uh, quite strong architectural changes that when we apply tetracycline. So here is the control biofilm, and here is the case of uh, growth inhibition due to tetracycline. And what, what's actually quite striking is that the biofilms still increase uh, their, their cell volume, and also the overall biofilm volume increases in the presence of tetracycline. And so, um, and I want to emphasize here is that no cells are dying. Biofilms are known to be highly tolerant of antibiotics. In this case, also, we observe that during the course of the six hours of tetracycline treatment, which is what we're studying here, no cells are actually dying. And so um, we can use our, uh, our tool, Biofilm Q, to quantify in, in great detail the architectural changes that are, that are occurring here. And, um, and that is uh, shown here. So here's a three-dimensional rendering. And uh, Francisco here, who, a PhD student in the lab, who, who led this project, um, uh, he's looking very professional here. Usually he doesn't look so professional, but his work has actually been very professional. So he's, he's doing really excellent work. And, um, uh, and so he's been analyzing these three-dimensional images. And for example, if we, if we look at just five cells here, you can see that when we show this time series here over six hours, the cells actually dramatically increase in size during tetracycline treatment and their cell spacing changes. And this can also be quantified here. Uh, so the cell volume increases and the cell density is reduced during tetracycline treatment. So we wondered whether we can somehow explain these two different phenotypes, the cell volume increase and the cell density reduction, um, potentially with the help of our model, right? Maybe, um, maybe that, uh, uh, maybe there are some kind of mechanical uh, underlying basis of this. Now for, let me go through these two phenotypes now, one by one, the cell volume expansion first, and then the cell density reduction. So regarding the cell volume expansion, we realized that actually, this wasn't really a physical phenomenon. We, we, we hypothesized that, that what could be going on here is that um, when we add a translational inhibitor, what that means is that they simply just can't make any new proteins, uh, but they still have all the existing proteins, all the enzymes that are already in the cells, they can still carry out their functions. So potentially we kind of thought maybe they still continue to do normal metabolism and that's why they're growing. That's why they're expanding their volume. And so to test this hypothesis, we um, we uh, did um, some metabolomic analysis here with the metabolic uptake and, and processing of heavy labeled glucose, so 13C labeled glucose. And we, we kind of traced how they uh, process that, that glucose into different metabolites. And, and you know, as a physicist, I was once really scared of these molecules. Now I actually love these molecules. They're really informative, you know? uh, but maybe let me just explain what, what, what they mean. So hexo-6-phosphate, is essentially glucose 6-phosphate directly after the uptake. And the two curves here, uh, the presence of kind of the uptake of glucose in the presence of tetracycline and without tetracycline. And if these two curves are identical, it means that they take up glucose in the same way as if uh, they were not treated with tetracycline. And that is in fact the case. So irrespective of whether the cells are treated with tetracycline, we found that they are actually um, taking up glucose in the same way, so the carbon source. Phosphoenolpyruvate is a very important glycolysis intermediate, so central carbon metabolism um, molecule that tells us that they're actually still being able to process, uh, that they still kind of do normal uh, carbon glycolysis uh, because the curves are identical. D-alanyl alanine is a cell wall precursor mm, telling us that these curves are not exactly identical here, but there's still this decrease here, which means that they're still uh, taking up, uh, they're still producing some uh, D-alanyl alanine, so they're still producing some cell wall. So uh, what it means altogether is that the cells are no performing normal metabolism largely uh, in the presence of tetracycline. And so if, if that was the cause of the cell volume expansion, so mechanistically, if that was really the cause, we should be able to shut down that cell volume expansion if we shut down central carbon metabolism. And of course, being bacteria and antibiotics, there's so many different antibiotics and there is actually one antibiotic that actually shuts down central carbon metabolism. This is called trimethoprim. And so if we do add that, then we see that in fact, they, they, so here they normally expand their volume in the presence of tetracycline. If we add trimethoprim, then they no longer expand their volume. So in fact, this hypothesis is correct and the cells still take up glucose, perform normal metabolism, make cell wall precursors. And that is the cause, the mechanistic cause of the cell volume expansion. Uh, 
Okay, so we're quite sure about that. That was one uh, result of the perturbation of applying translation inhibitors to biofilms. Now, what about the other result that we saw? And that um, it was the cell density reduction that we saw of the biofilms due to the breakdown of the, of the um, yeah, and maybe before I say that it's due to the breakdown, I should explain why it is the breakdown. So, so what could be the cause of the cell density reduction? So um, this was really actually puzzling for, for, to us for quite a few years. So this study maybe took like five years or so, maybe actually only four years. And probably a large part of that was just uh, explaining um, uh, why the cell density was, was being reduced. You know, what, what is the mechanistic base of this? And so I think we went quite far in terms of explaining this molecular mechanism, um, as I will show you here. So what we realized after some time was that the, one thing that occurs when you add uh, antibiotics was that the cells detach from the matrix. And this is going to feature a little bit more also in the later part of the talk. So, what happens here in blue is, uh, are the cells, um, showing the cells. Um, and in yellow is a particular matrix component, RBMA. This is the matrix component that was involved in the cell cell attraction. And we can label it here with an, uh, with an uh, antibody. And so you can see here is that over time, the cells separate from, this, from these pockets of RBMA. You can see that they just detach from these pockets of RBMA. And this can also be quantified here. So if we measure the amount of RBMA surrounding each cell in the space-time chymographs, the space-time heat maps that I introduced for bio from Q at the beginning of the talk, you can see that over time, um, the, 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 the amount of RBMA surrounding each cell is decreasing. It's not because the amount of RBMA in total is decreasing. It's just because the amount of RBMA around the cells are decreasing. And so, um, yeah, so they're detaching from uh, RBMA separating from the cells. And we uh, found that this is due to a particular uh, protein called RBMB, which turns over the bonds between the cells and the matrix. And if we, if we uh, delete this RBMB protein, the cell density reduction, here's the photo wild type, the cell density reduction is decreased. And actually when we overexpress RBMB, we can recapitulate the cell density reduction, um, which is quite good indication that this is actually going on. So somehow, RBMB is, is cutting the bonds between the cells and the matrix, which we can see here uh, going on. So how does that lead to a cell density reduction? Well, we thought that potentially what's going on is that if the biofilm is under mechanical compression, um, if you then cut the bonds between the cells and the matrix, then uh, the biofilm would release that mechanical compression and, and expand. So is this a relief of mechanical compression? Well, for this, we could actually use our mechanical model to test this idea that there is a mechanical compression and the way that we tested this was by trying to um, um, recapitulate the experimental data here for the cell density reduction. So what we see experimentally in these space-time diagrams here is that this is the spatial dimension of the biofilm again, this is the outer biofilm boundary, and this is the time of the biofilm. You can see that the density decreases in the biofilm and also the biofilm expands overall during uh, antibiotic treatment. Now, we can now use our mechanical simulations to grow a biofilm, and then we, simulate various aspects of the, of the phenomena that we found. So we could, for example, uh, cut the bonds between the cells and the matrix, and that apparently wasn't sufficient uh, for explaining this, uh, this phenomenon. You can see that this density certainly decreases, but the biofilm outer boundary doesn't increase as strongly as we see it in the experiments. If we only increase the cell volume, um, uh, which we found uh, was an experimental phenomenon, that also doesn't decrease, th that doesn't explain the experiments because we, we don't change the density anymore. But if we have both phenomena together, the decreased cell-cell attraction and the increased cell volume, then we actually get a good agreement between the experiments and the simulations. And actually, I want to kind of point out here is that the color map here is really uh, the same. Um, so we, I think, have a really quite good agreement between experiments and simulations uh, based on only this mechanical input of the simulation. So um, having talked about many perturbations of this model, let me now uh, uh, probe the limit probe the limits of this model, right? So uh, apparently this model is, is quite successful at explaining many aspects of biofilm development up to a few thousand cells. And so the question is, what is the limit at which this model breaks down of mechanical, uh, simula uh, mechanical interactions? And so we probe this limit by simply continuing the simulation beyond uh, the number of cells for which we extract the parameters. So this is a logarithmic scale here. And we extracted the parameters for the gray region here. Uh, so up to 300 cells. And so if we continue the simulation beyond that, uh, that um, 300 cells, then we still see a relatively good agreement quantitatively 
Um, but after around this point here or so, there's actually some qualitative divergences that happen between the experiments and the simulation, um, 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 which, which tell us that, that beyond a few thousand cells, uh, somehow this interaction, this mechanical interaction model seems to break down. There are probably other interactions that then become important um, for, for 1,000 cells, so they still look quite similar, but then for a few thousand cells, there's really some large scale patterns that, that don't really uh, agree with the experiments. And so we're, of course, really intensively trying to identify what the cell-cell interactions are that, that then kick in and maybe take over from mechanical interactions as the dominant ones. And so, so my hypothesis is that really metabolic interactions are the key. And so we've been, over the last three years, really intensively focusing on these metabolic interactions. And so one thing that we just published, or not yet published, but we just put it on, on bioarchive a few weeks ago, uh, was that we discovered some carbon and nitrogen cross-feeding in colonies based on uh, a, a new interaction that's based on alanine, uh, an amino acid that they share. But, but I maybe won't go into details here. It's maybe a little bit too biological here. So um, to summarize a part of the talk, the question that I've, that I've started out with was the question of what are the mechanisms that determine biofilm development? And I focused on the sub-question of what are the key cell-cell interactions that dominate? And I've shown you that we've got this, uh, this microscopy image analysis platform now where we can track biofilm development at cellular resolution for thousands of cells. And we can use that data to constrain um, agent-based models. And from these agent-based models, we found that mechanical interactions seem to be sufficient for accounting for biofilm development. And um, we can show that under this model holds true under various perturbations. So we looked at genetic perturbations. So we manipulated the cell-cell interactions. I've shown you that. We manipulated the environment, the environment um, by applying various flow, uh, shear flow conditions. We also manipulated the growth um, with antibiotics, and that also worked quite well. And we also looked at different species in some work that I didn't show. Now, <clears throat> let me now go back to the central question that I've asked at the beginning, the question of which mechanism determine biofilm development, and, and talk about the other aspect of biofilm lifestyle. Um, and that is that, of course, biofilms don't only form. It's not a one-way street. As with every kind of uh, population uh, that lives in the environment, uh, there's also the population disassembly, the dispersal of biofilms. So if you think about a marine snow particle, of course, uh, this community would want to form on that, on that uh, particle. But at some point, if the, if the nutrients on that nutrient patch are exhausted, you probably want to uh, um, disperse. And so um, the question is, how do these biofilms disperse? What are the triggers for dispersal, the exact mechanistic triggers, and how they actually disassemble that biofilm? And so... Um, so uh, the question we had here was how do Vibrio cholera um, respond to, uh, to changes in flow and starvation? And the way that we grow these biofilms, I want to kind of mention here again, is, is that we uh, grow them in these microfluidic flow chambers where we have a syringe pump to flow in fresh kind of um, uh, marine medium, essentially through there. And, um, and then we grow them. And then uh, one thing that we tried, for example, was that we stopped the flow, right? And when you stop the flow, you can see that these biofilm structures here uh, disperse quite rapidly within a few hours. They leave behind only a few cells that are attached to the surfaces. So they, they uh, have this strong dispersal response when you stop the flow. And so we wonder, what are the actual triggers? What are they sensing? Is it that they're sensing kind of changes in the shear? Is it that they're changing, uh, sensing changes in buildup of, of metabolites that maybe accumulate when you stop the flow? Or is it that they're depleting the nutrients when you change the flow? And so we we applied various kind of more precise uh, ways of, of, uh, of uh, environmental conditions here. So this is the response of the biofilm biomass to stopping the flow. So there's a strong reduction in the biomass, so they're dispersing. We also, if you just keep the flow, but you're removing the glucose or the carbon source, they're also dispersing quite strongly. And uh, to changes in oxic environments, they're also responding. Other um, conditions don't seem to change the, the biofilm dispersal response. So we thought, okay, um, stopping the flow uh, is, is important. Um, um, removing glucose is apparently important, so starvation is important. So we thought that um, there are two key regulators that, um, that might be responding to metabolic buildup and to starvation. And so we generated reporters for each of them. So for starvation, there's a general stress response um, uh, sigma factor called RPOS, which responds essentially to starvation. And so we, uh, we looked at the space-time uh, diagrams for biofilms um, uh, dynamically here, 
um, when we apply glucose removal, so when you remove glucose, we see an induction of this reporter. So the stress is being induced. So this kind of makes sense because they're, you're starving them. But also when you're stopping the flow, apparently that is inducing the starvation. Effect. This is a red dashed line here indicates uh, statistical significant changes. Now, um, for the other reporter, which is the reporter that senses um, metabolite buildup essentially uh, through quorum sensing, we generated a reporter for HAP R, which is the major quorum sensing uh, transcription factor in Vibrio cholera. And that one doesn't really respond to glucose removal. So starvation doesn't really kick in that reporter, but stopping the flow does induce that reporter. So it seems like both of these um, um, uh, processes, RPOS or so starvation and quorum sensing, are responding to stopping the flow, uh, but only one of them is responding to removing of the glucose. So probably both of these reporters might be involved. And so to test that, we generate various deletions. So when you delete uh, the quorum sensing reporter, they no longer disperse. So negative values here are this dispersal response for the wild type. Uh, so when you delete quorum sensing, they can no longer disperse. When you delete RPOS, the stress response for starvation, they can also no longer disperse. But when you induce uh, quorum sensing, they disperse. And also when you induce the uh, starvation variants, they disperse. So somehow both of these signals seem to be integrating. So what we think is going on is that they sense both the nutrients at the single cell level, and they sense the collective population size via quorum sensing um, through the autoducer signals. And only in the conditions when they have high RPOS and high uh, HAP R, only then do they disperse. And so What's going on here is that, that, that the cells combine an individual cell level sensing mechanism, namely starvation, with a collective cell level sensing mechanism by a quorum sensing to regulate this dispersal transition. So this is something that we discovered a couple of years ago, a few years ago, and we now dug in a lot more mechanistically, you know, uh, to find out really how the cells are dispersing from this. And this is, will just be uh, the, the last few, few minutes of the talk. So how are they actually dispersing? Now we've kind of understand the regulation of this dispersal. How are the cells actually uh, releasing themselves from the biofilm? And for this, we, uh, we study this process in the context of quorum sensing, uh, sorry, in the context of glucose removal. And we specifically yeah, remove glucose to, to uh, see how the cells are detaching from the biofilms. We can follow this at single cell resolution. And when we looked at this carefully, Again, with uh, labeling the RBMA component of the matrix, this is something uh, reminiscent of the other part of the talk for, for how they uh, responded to antibiotic treatment, we see that the cells are detaching from the matrix again. So, um, so they're leaving behind shells of the matrix. So here I pointed out some, some cells that are departing. So these cells here are departing in the next frame. Here you can see this cell is departing in the next frame and so on. So they're, depart they're, they're detaching from the matrix. So how are they detaching from the matrix? For this, we uh, did a transcriptome analysis to find uh, um, how, um, which enzymes might be cleaving the bonds between the cells in the matrix. And we performed RNA sequencing by comparing the dispersing population and the non-dispersing population. We found 77 potential candidates. 77 is like a lot of numbers. And this took some while to clone all of these. And so we generated overexpression clones for each one of these 77 candidates. And we found that four of these candidates actually, when we induce the expression of them, actually induce dispersal. So negative values here mean that they are dispersing when we induce the expression of this gene. Now, the most highly uh, potent biofilm in dispersal inducer was this gene called uh, VC0142, which we uh, relabeled, uh, which we gave it a name. It's called now VBDR, so Vibrio Dispersal Regulator. And, um, and we found that that gene wasn't actually an enzyme that cleaves any bonds between the cells in the matrix. This was actually apparently a regulator. And so, um, so we studied how this regulator now uh, does the, the matrix uh, secretion, uh, the cutting cuts the bonds between the matrix. And so to do that, we studied the regulon of VBDR and we did again a transcriptome analysis. We found that there are only eight genes that are uh, differentially regulated by VBDR. And we found that, that two of them are really interesting. And those are the first ones, the most highly uh, regulated genes, PIL-T and PIL-U. And they um, are known to be retraction ATPases for type 4 pili. So type 4 pili are these little uh, appendages that are known for surface attachment. And, um, and so apparently what's happening is that this regulator that we discovered, VBDR, seems to induce the retraction of the pili. And to test whether this is actually true, we, um, 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 uh, maybe I'll skip over this here, it's a little bit too detailed maybe. 
um, we, we looked at which genes are, um, um, which pili are in a biofilm, and we found that actually the only pili that are present in uh, vibrio cholera biofilms are these MSHA pili, which we labeled here with an antibody. Um, in, in magenta, you can see that these magenta spots are everywhere in the biofilm. So we discovered this to be a new matrix component of vibrio cholera biofilms. So this is a, a new thing. And apparently this pillar's retraction seems to be important because when we induce VBDR and we measure the pillar's abundance, we see that they reduce the pillar compared. So there's basically more blue here than, than this one. This is more green than this one. And also when we induce the pillar's retraction, ATPA is the primary one, pill T, we see a reduction in the MSHA pillar. So is this, have we solved this puzzle, how the cells are actually dispersing? Um, well, we tested that, uh, whether that was sufficient. So when we induce VBDR, we can see a dispersal. When we induced the pillar's retraction, that didn't induce dispersal. So this was kind of a little bit of a shame at first. We thought, ah, we, we missed the major point here. Um, but then we realized that actually VBDR also controls another enzyme that seems to break another component of the matrix, this RBMA um, component, this uh, enzyme we call IVRP. And when we induce both together, then we can induce dispersal. So now for the first time for a dispersal of biofilms, we discovered a mechanism that is sufficient for causing biofilm dispersal. We found how they actually cu cut themselves out of the matrix. And that is that they, they retract the pili to release the bonds between the cells in the matrix. And then they have to break the matrix a little bit with this other gene that opens up gaps in the matrix. And that is how the cells are, are departing from the biofilm. So this is a really quite deep mechanistic explanation of how cells are cutting themselves out from the matrix. So to summarize this part of the talk, um, how do vibrio cholera biofilms disperse? I've shown you that uh, they uh, send starvation and quorum sensing, a unicellular and a multicellular level uh, um, uh, phenomenon. And they jointly regulate this regulator VBDR. And that regulator VBDR is actually what causes dispersal by controlling the MSHA pillars retraction, which releases the cells from the matrix. And then together there has to be a joint phenomenon where, where this other uh, enzyme, IVP, degrades some of the matrix component, RBMA, that actually opens the gaps in the matrix so that the cells can actually depart. So with that, uh, I'd like to close and of course thank, I think I thanked all the people who, as I went along here during the talk, but I also want to thank the people behind the scenes who are doing all the image analysis, this particularly Raimo Hartmann, Anna Jekyll, and, and Eric Belli in my talk. And of course I want to thank the collaborators, uh, Jörn Dunkel at MIT, he's a long-standing collaborator, and also Fitnat Yildiz, a uh, long-standing collaborator uh, at UCSC. Um, who's a Vibrio Cholera expert, and actually also a biofilm expert. So thank you for your attention, of course, and I'm, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Okay, thanks. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating talk. So um, I'll be, well, collecting um, questions uh, in, in the chat. Uh, mm -hmm. Whenever you guys have one, just type it there. In the meantime, um, while we while we wait, actually, I I had, actually, I have a few questions. <laughs> okay, yeah. But I guess that uh, one thing I didn't really understand is, um, uh, so is your idea that the uh, is the cell body that is attached to the matrix, or is it the pili that are attached to the matrix? Yeah, it seems to be. Um... From what we know is that what is really required is that the pili have to be retracted. So from that, we conclude that the primary attachment is actually through the pili. Um, but is, is, uh, do I have to have in mind the fact that the pili sort of penetrate or adhere to the, to the matrix and the, this bond needs, yeah. to be, uh, needs to be cleaved? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, that, that's, I think that, that's our picture. So we, we've, uh, in, in this uh, preprint, we also um, uh, looked at the binding partners of the, uh, of the MSHA pili, and the MSHA pili really bind to a lot of stuff, uh, also in the matrix. So they are very sticky uh, pili, and um, we think that the cells are primarily anchored in the biofilm through these pili, actually, which okay. was a bit of a surprise, because we thought that maybe they have direct adhesions to the matrix. Um, but it seems these pili are the primary anchoring points. If you don't retract the pili, you cannot disperse. So that's the only uh, thing that is really required. Um, okay. May, may, maybe there are other uh, uh, anchoring points through the matrix, but this is the only one, the pillar, the only thing that's really, the pillar's retraction is the only thing that's required. For okay. 
So there are two raised hands. One is Uria, the other one is uh, Jonas. Uh, so I don't know, let's go. The first one that I have here is Uria. So maybe we go with you and then okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, Knut, as usual, is uh, amazing. Um, I wanted to ask a, a little bit technical question and sorry about uh, being too uh, biology oriented. Uh, is the other enzyme is a protease? Is it um, something yeah. related to really degrading, proteolytically uh, yes. degrading yes, everything is which is there? So is it a specific one for the uh, RBMA or some? Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a serine protease. Um, and it has it has been known to previous papers have shown from Matt Walder specifically uh, they, they found that it cleaves it processes RBMA. So um, so the, directly relate just for this uh, specific one. Yes. Yeah. And the the other question is more general is uh, about. But but uh, let me one, one more. Oh question. sorry. It's it's interesting that that enzyme so cleaving RBMA alone is not sufficient. So mm -hmm. if if you only cleave RBMA you, they they can't depart from the bio. And so, um, so we, yeah, so, so it's interesting. I, th I think this was always puzzling. I think um, to find things that are actually sufficient or like mechanistically, if you can kind of turn on each component that is required for biofilm, I think then we've kind of at least understood a little bit on how they're cutting themselves off. And I, mm -hmm. I think previously, no one had really found conditions that really, uh, I totally it's agree. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think, and I think there is more for it also. I'm, I'm sure there are additional uh, processes going on. And, and you know, I think also a different, uh, so, so, so my, my, my general view on this is that biofilm formation is highly regulated. There are many regulators. Actually, when you, do, when you, um, when you look at uh, mutants of cholera, uh, so there's a genome-wide knockout library of cholera, yeah. Approximately 10% of all deletions have a biofilm phenotype. So biofilm regulation is super yeah. highly regulated. And there is no reason for why biofilm dispersal should not also be highly regulated. So I think- yeah, Especially if you look at it from the perspective of the bacteria, if they are attached yeah. to marine snow, mm -hmm. they have to detach. Otherwise they will go, you know, 4,000 meters below and it's yes. a dead end. So there have to they, be a mechanism to be sinking to extinction, yeah? Yes, yeah, uh, there must so, be- uh, super highly regulated, just yeah. in the same way, I think as the biofilm buildup has to be regulated. And so, so there are probably many regulators, there are many ways in, that are probably also redundant with each other and so on. So yeah, I, I think so that's a very related to what I was uh, trying to ask is that if this is a, a general mechanism, uh, many bacteria has it, or it's just very specific to this one organism. And uh, that's what, that's my last question. Sorry to take so yeah, much time. It's good. No, I, th I think, um, so we, so this is a mechanistic study, which then becomes like very necessarily quite detailed about the molecular molecules involved and so on. Um, so I, I don't know if other species also do this. Of course, other species have these MSH pili, especially all the Vibrio species have them. Uh, and so, um, so, so likely I would say, you know, um, uh, and this regulator VBDR is conserved among all Vibrios. Um, so this is an, yeah, it's, it's a protein that is not coding for an enzyme. So, so it's very likely this reg, a regulator. And I think it seems the primary role seems to be this dispersal. So, so it seems to be at least conserved among Vibrios. Thank you very much. There are probably you. other Amazing. regulators also. Yeah. <laughs> so Jonas. Hi, Knut. Uh, thanks Hi, a lot for the talk. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. Uh, one question is uh, for the shear rates that deform the biofilm to have like this sort of deformed droplet shape. Where do you expect such high shear rates to occur? Because you're reaching I think, hundreds high. of yes. yes, two thousand per second. Yes, um, I think you can. Um, so they're they're probably not realistic anymore in terms of uh, what a marine snow particle would would feel. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I think we I think we made some estimates, and I think you you can of course get them in pipes and so on. In pipes. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. It's, it's I, I think it was. I, I think to some extent. Um, we wanted to have like as large of a order of magnitude change to see the, the, the scope of possibilities, you know. Um, sure. I think marine snow is certainly not in the 2000 uh, per second uh, uh, re regime. And uh, a qu quick second question uh, with the pili uh, things. Do you mm -hmm. think planktonic bacteria can also um, retract and uh, sort of uh, eject pili as they, as they are suspended as individuals? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think this pillars retraction actually makes a lot of sense because as a dispersal mechanism, because it's individual based and it doesn't require uh -huh. you, it's very fast. So if uh -huh. you can use this uh, pillars retraction, um, this ATPase, then within a few few minutes, I think you can or actually on the second time scale, you can release yourself. If you, but if do you think process they... is based on an enzyme, it takes a lot mm -hmm. longer and the enzymes actually have to get outside of the cell. So um, it, it's a more complicated process, mm -hmm. I would say. And at the initial stage of the formation, when uh, so do do biact uh, when when bacteria say uh, wait for an opportunity to be attached to a surface, do they have the the pili ready to be to be attached? Are they uh, yeah. fully extended? Yeah. yeah. Do you know? I think or... this is like it's beginning to become more clear now because mm -hmm. I think a lot of groups are working on on pillars dynamics. So um, mm -hmm. Alex Persat in um, at EPFL and, and yes. Melanie Blokesh from the mm -hmm. genetic side and was Yenal in at the biocentrum on the molecular side again. So, so it's just like, th there's the boom in pillars research somehow. Okay. Everyone, wherever they look, now they yeah. find type four pillar, including, mm -hmm. including us, you know? And, um, and uh, yes, so in the cholera case, uh, they constantly have these MSHA pili and they are um, required for permanent attachment to uh, surfaces. Uh, flagella are also sticky to surface, but apparently only for like transient sticking mm -hmm. and only when they then stick with the MSH pili, they become more permanently attached. Um, okay, and that's I think, I think very what, interesting. What we kind of found new is that actually it's not just for the surface attachment, it's actually also for the cell matrix attachment. Cell to cell, okay. Which, which I thought was in, well, yeah, it's kind of like cell to cell, but through the matrix. So it's like mm -hmm. cell to matrix attachment. Mm -hmm. So the matrix mm -hmm. seems to be this kind of, the structure uh, mm -hmm. making these shells around the cells and the cells mm -hmm. just, you know, hook onto this matrix by, by mm -hmm. these pili. Mm -hmm. So there is an extra That's question on uh, pili physiology, I guess, from Lisa Fauci. Mm -hmm. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I think you answered my question. So this, uh, the, the retraction comes from a conformational change. Is that what? Um, um, and it's a little bit different. Um, so the retraction um, comes from the action of this, uh, this so, so, so the, the, the pili extension and retraction is powered by um, an ATPase. Uh, so it needs like energy to, to make the pillars and to retract the pillars. And um, this ATPase is, is called a pill T and there's another one called pill U. And, um, and so they, they power, yeah, it, it's, an, it's an active process that the cells have to decide that, that, that they do. Um, and uh, we, we, can, we can tip the balance by making more of this, of this enzyme, this ATPase, but ultimately it's an ATP consuming process. So actually it's, it's, a, it's a process that even if you don't change the number of this, this, AT, this pill T, this, N, this ATPase, by just changing the, the um, it, it's a post-translationally post uh, regulated process that basically works via ATP consumption. So it's, uh, yeah. Mm. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I don't know if there is any other uh, question. Mm. So this, this pillars dynamics is, is being like actively investigated at the moment a lot. Uh, so molecular structures of pillar pili have been published and so on. And I think we're big, learning more and more how important they are also for DNA uptake. So the cells can go fishing with, with the pili to take up DNA. There are many interesting phenomena um, associated with, with type 4 pili. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I'll uh, 